happening. Molly, I'm going to go ahead and take a stab at each one, and then I'll say, okay. Molly, do you have anything to add? All right, I'm going to scroll back from the bottom up and answer questions as I hit them. Again, everything will be typed up, so we will get to all of the questions. Do you need to be licensed to apply in rental units in Maine? Yes, I don't know what the threshold is. The different states vary. Go to that National Pesticide Information Center website, and it'll be able to tell you, I think in New York, it's six units or more that you need um, in applicator's license, even if the unit is vacant. That's something to note. Let me just pull up my email. Thank you for your patience. Um, I just everyone. saw a question from Clarence Johnson, and that is a, a good question. We started, um, we're looking at doing a year of monitoring in this apartment complex that we're working in, and we started in January. Um, so a year from now, we should have some concrete data on the the costs saved and the um, whether or not the diatomaceous earth applications and the protocol were effective in um, helping to control the bed bug infestation at the apartment complex. So hopefully by January. <laughs> Great. And for those of you who aren't familiar with it, I do have a blog that's linked to off of stoppest.org and when Molly has research results I'll post it on the blog. I've got the questions from Leanne in front of me. The first one was why should the encasements be a snug fit? And the answer there is because every little fold is a crevice that a bed bug could tuck into. So um, if you want them to be a snug fit so that they are easy to inspect. I see it's 2.30 now, so those of you who do have to leave us now, thank you again so much for joining, and you'll get an email from me soon. But I'm just going to proceed with these questions. Other than interceptors, night watch, and visual inspection, are there any other monitoring methods? Those are the main ones. As far as monitoring goes, visual inspection is actually an inspection, not a monitoring method. Um, there are a lot of products out there being advertised as monitoring devices. Some use corrugated cardboard, a lot of different attractants. It's really the hot spot on the market right now is developing different bed bug monitors. Um, my recommendation is that any that you're considering ask to see their peer-reviewed data if they have any or objective data that they didn't pay to have done. And you're welcome to email me at stoppests at cornell.edu and ask if I've seen any data as well. Um, Molly, do you have any additions to that? The question again was other than interceptors, night watch, and visual inspection. Um, not there that any other really are available right now. I know that um, Ali and I just returned from a conference in Atlanta where a lot of people were talking about monitors. Um, and so I think in the future there will be some, but there aren't any more available right at this time. Okay, the do-it-yourself box. I think one of the questions that need to be summarized again, and hopefully we have got that. Um, we've we did get the audio on that. Fortunately, the link that Mo Molly provided is a video instruction, so it's very clear on how to make this box. Uh, Molly, do you have anything to add as far as your experience with having housing authorities do this for themselves? <laughs> um, do this for themselves? Several of them have indicated interest in, um, instead of doing it in one room, doing it on a trailer so that it can be moved from... Um, different unit to unit and complex to complex really um, and they are really enjoying doing that and it's making it a lot easier. Uh, a lot of them are also incorporating the use of heat box um, no questions asked at the at move-in um, no matter what to try and stop some of the um, influx of bed bugs. Um, is Cedarside effective? A local housing pro provider here in Portland, and I assume that's Portland, Oregon, uses this exclusively in multifamily buildings. It might be Portland, Maine. It doesn't really matter. Um, there, Cedarside is, I believe, a 25B product at this point. I've heard good results on it. I'm trying to think of, and Molly may know, of a peer-reviewed research study on Cedarside. I, from what I'm remembering, um, they were looking at separating the different ingredients 
within Cedarside to figure out what exactly was having the effect and it in some cases was the inert ingredients not the cedar oil itself. Um, with any product you're looking for, if you can get the bugs, if you can access the bug with the product most of the time yes it's going to kill them. Um, that stands true even for water. So it's really worth trying to figure out, piece out what makes different products effective and what parts of the bed bug system, whether it is their enzymes that break down the pesticide or the thickness of their cuticle, exactly why they're resistant to certain products. Um, but cedar side, I'm hearing a lot of people are using it. I was actually in a facility yesterday that they're using it. You just always want to take precautions, follow the label directions, and note that there is no such thing as a non-toxic pesticide because these chemicals are designed to kill I don't Molly, do know anything, anything about cedar side, so no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> very good. Will washing the clothes cause the bed bugs to drown? Unless the water is more than 122 degrees, how would this be effective? I may have answered that in part previously. Yes, bed bugs will drown. The tricky part to bed bug control is their eggs, and as um, as extension folks, we want to make res recommendations that are pretty fail-proof. And so we say hot water because a lot of folks have their water heaters programmed at 120 degrees, which is right up there near that thermal death point. Um, so hot water gives you a better chance than using cold water of killing the bugs. Drowning may get most of them. That is true. Uh, it's the high heat in the dryer that we're relying on to get to the eggs and really finish them off. One thing to note is that you can check the lint trap of the dryer to see if any bed bugs were caught, and that's another nice way of verifying that it worked. Um, the only reason Molly, we would uh, even recommend washing the clothes in hot water is if they were dirty. Um, really, the killer is the dryer heat. So that's that's all for that. Especially if people are using laundromats mm -hmm. and things like that. And that's a huge cost savings too. Where it costs money too. every time. Exactly. Laundromats get really expensive. So it is the, the hot dryer that is the killing method. Any recommendations for treating units where a tenant has hoarding issues? I did type a response to this, but I will, in the written response, give a link to our guidance document on how to do IPM in a hoarding home. I've done some research with a Boston University researcher whose expertise is in hoarding, and I worked with her to develop a guidance. Um, hoarding is a serious mental health issue, and so you're combating not only pest control, but you have to do pest control in a way that's sensitive to the the special needs of that resident. But I say if we can do this in a hoarded home, we can do it anywhere. So it's worth reading the recommendations and applying them to other sites as well. No, Molly, but it to does make hoarding? bug treatment a whole lot more difficult. <laughs> okay. So it's something you want to deal with separately. <laughs> yes. Did... <laughs> Do the heat generators operating at 140 degrees kill bed bugs? Um, my experience with heat treatment, it's not, so you want to have a heat source that is compliant with local code. That's been the limiting factor in different places where I've worked and some some generators that require the source to be outside and be pumped in, that's not always going to work for a high-rise building when you're trying to work up on the 20th floor, for example. Once you start to apply the heat within the home, it's all about air movement, getting that heat to move around the home and at certain points within the treatment be moving the cushions, be moving the furniture to expose new cold spots to that killing heat and also having monitors placed throughout in areas where you think there may be a cold spot. So do heat generators operating at 140 degrees kill bed bugs? I can't say specifically. I haven't worked with, I'd have to know the make and model and talk to folks who are doing a lot of heat treatments, but the, um, the companies that are selling heat setups, heat systems specifically for bed bugs. It's really all about those monitors and making sure that your data loggers show that you are reaching 122 degrees at every point within the home. No, Molly, no, just as long as everything gets up to, to the that? above 122, um, but that's the most difficult part. So if you have something going up to 140, I think mm -hmm. that should be effective. Definitely, uh, if you're taking 
whole unit heat treatments in-house, talk to a company that's doing it and has some good experience and talk to the reps. They should be able to give you a lot of warnings. We've learned a lot of lessons on how to do heat treatments. For example, old tiles may lift up. You got to flush the toilet so the wax seal doesn't melt. All these little nuances that you want to learn about before you start doing this on your own. The next question is diatomaceous earth. Is it considered a pesticide? How if it is non-toxic? Um, and diatomaceous earth is a pesticide and so it's not non-toxic but we do call it least toxic. The active ingredient in diatomaceous earth is a least toxic product. Um, and do you need to be licensed to apply in rental units in Maine? I did answer that one and the answer is Yes, I do believe you do. The best place to find that would to go to the National Pesticide Information Center link, um, and that's that npic.orst.edu link I have listed on the screen. And I'm going back to my email because Leanne has emailed me even more questions. And Molly, I'm good sitting here as long as okay, we I'm need to. If now. you need to sign off, just let us know. Um, the, Okay, the next question is, have you used small carbon dioxide canisters to identify an infestation? Um, I believe you're talking about, in that case, there was an, Rutgers published an instruction on how to build your own monitor using a cooler that you put dry ice in, and that dry ice would release CO2 and attract the bed bugs in, and it was shown to be effective when done by a researcher, but we do not make that recommendation in our program just because using dry ice there is a lot of things that can go wrong and I don't want to promote something that has that much risk associated with it. As far as small carbon dioxide canisters that you might buy for example at camping or something those canisters are what releases the CO2 in the active monitors that we mentioned and you'd go to one of those sporting goods stores to have them refilled so Yes, I've used um, active monitors that use small carbon dioxide canisters, if that's what you're talking about. If not, if I'm not answering that question correctly, um, send me an email at stoppests at cornell.edu, and I will try and clarify that. Nope. The next question, anything to add there, Molly? Okay. For low-income folks, can't they just use a plastic container with talcum powder in it under the bed legs? Uh, it's actually those climb-up insect interceptors are pretty darn cheap. I don't think you're going to, it won't be that much cheaper to buy plastic containers versus talcum powder. You can certainly try it. I encourage innovation that doesn't involve using a pesticide. Uh, you've got the right thought there as far as you want a plastic surface that bed bugs can't crawl up to escape. One of the issues with using a plastic container is that bugs that are crawling across the floor trying to get up onto the bed wouldn't be able to get into that container. One benefit of the interceptors is that the bugs can get caught in the outer well when they try and get to the bed or be caught in the inner well when they're trying to get from the bed. Nope. Anything else to but add there, Molly? Well, actually, there are um, a lot more of those plastic traps other than just the climb-up interceptor um, for all different prices and sizes and colors and things like that available um, online, um, including the bed moat is a one, and then the unbuggable trap also, just as a couple of other examples. Mm-hmm. Lots of examples out there. With anything, I would encourage you to have the manufacturer send you a sample and run your own test where you know you have an active infestation. Make sure it works before you order anything in bulk. Um, final question I have here, and Leanne may have emailed me more, is can you send info about the machine shown in the early slides that was used to attract and trap bed bugs? And yes, I will um, put that in the written response of the bed bugs. Another question that just came in, could we not just use any container box, for example, on a truck? It could be used in different places as a heat box. And I'll let uh, Molly respond to that. So using building um, Some people, some apartment truck. complexes have worked to do that. Um, one apartment complex we worked with actually built a small shed um, just strictly for the purpose of using it as a, a heat chamber. Um, and also people have used... Uh, containers and built heat boxes on the backs of trailers 
I don't know uh, if you're talking about like a, a regular old truck bed or something like that. I don't really think that would be effective because it probably wouldn't be quite big enough to get all the furniture you would want in there. But um, other places can definitely be used as a heat chamber. Um, and it would really just be what you or your um, or a facility that you're working with would be comfortable with building and um, how much you would be comfortable spending on constructing the heat chamber. And if you are looking into that and you're going to invest a significant amount of money in building something like this, get in touch with us and we'll put you in touch with hopefully someone in your area who has experience with heat or maybe Molly's program and they can coach you through how you might um, insulate a box well enough to be able to have it on the bed of a truck. I've also heard of um, housing agencies that take one unit offline and dedicate mm -hmm. that to a a bed bug sauna, so to speak. So exactly. there's a lot of different ways to kill this bug. <laughs> I've got two more questions by email. Does rubbing alcohol help in the prevention of bed bugs? Our third party management company is always spraying their office chairs with alcohol. This is a really good question. Thank you so much for asking it. Um, rubbing alcohol like water will kill bed bugs, but it doesn't have any Res residual action. It's not a preventative. If the rubbing alcohol, when it's wet, contacts the bug, it will kill it. But once it dries, it does not kill it. And we do not ever recommend using rubbing alcohol against bed bugs because rubbing alcohol is not labeled as a pesticide and thus it should not be used as one. Um, one warning if you're, if that, um, advice gets out in your community. I've heard of at least three cases now where residents get it and get that recommendation and run with it and they hose down their beds with rubbing alcohol and then they sit at night and smoke. And we've had a few cases where people's apartments go up in flames because they've got so much rubbing alcohol sprayed around their home. So it's a, uh, it's a health threat and we don't recommend rubbing alcohol. If you're wanting to hose something down to kill bugs on contact, you just Use one or, of the heat methods that we've talked about today. Don't get yeah, too, too creative when like it comes to Yeah, if you feel like spraying animals. something ahead, is going to be more effective than to spray hot water does would do the same thing to drown the bed bug as mm -hmm. rubbing alcohol would. Yep. Mm -hmm. Office chairs, you can see this pest. So I understand that a lot of office staff are very concerned about residents bringing in bed bugs to the office. Um, one recommendation I'd make is to have the, the chairs that the residents sit in fairly simple and easy to inspect and do inspection, visual inspection with a flashlight of those quite frequently. And also you can have a plastic Tupperware, a large tub where residents can set their belongings during the meeting. And that way they're not setting their purse on your desk or on the floor next to your desk. And so if there's a bug on that purse, it's contained within the Tupperware. When they get up and leave, you can just take a quick look. Again, you can see this bug so you'd see them crawling around in the bottom of the Tupperware you can just flush them down the toilet nope anything to add there Molly okay you mentioned dry moisture how do you figure out if you are using or not using too much water does it vary by steam machine um, and this is something that I believe the manufacturers add yeah it does Molly. vary by steam machine time. and um if you were to, say, go to Walmart or something and buy what they call a professional-grade garment steamer, um, chances are it's not going to be top of the line. Um, and I don't know if any of you have ever used steamers before, but sometimes if you hold the nozzle at certain angles, it may leak and just sort of drip out water. Um, that's what you're trying to avoid um, for the most part there. Um, in Insecticide grade, I mean, I don't think they're actually called insecticide grade, but um, steamers that are used by professional um, pest, pest control companies um, are labeled to have a more dry, uh, a more dry steam, uh, which just doesn't have any of those moisture um, or leaking issues that some of the um, really consumer available machines would. Mm -hmm. 
and you can search steamer bed bug and I would really we're always promoting even if you are taking components of your bed bug control program or your entire bed bug control program with licensed staff in-house we encourage you to partner with a local pest control company and um, use their expertise use what they've learned ask them what different devices they've found to work and they may be willing to partner with you um, provide training for you and perhaps that's what you pay them for is your staff training and coaching more than pesticide application itself I got one more question and then I think I'm caught up with the chat box here thank you all for those of you who decided to stay on the line longer is food grade diatomaceous earth effective you want to have um, diatomaceous earth that's labeled as an insecticide there's lot there's diatomaceous earth out also out there for pool chemicals and you want the insecticide diatomaceous earth it's it has to do with the difference of the size of the diatom. Yeah, food grade and um, insecticide um, grade are actually the same type um it's just some people actually take diatomaceous earth as a food supplement and it's the same type that is used as an insecticide. The difference is between um, the food or insecticide grade and the filtration grade which is used in swimming pool filters and that filtration grade has been heat treated and it's processing which caused the, um, the diatoms to change shape and actually makes them an inhalation hazard. And so if you go to Lowe's or something like that, chances are um, when you ask the people that work there are going to direct you towards this filtration grade which is hazardous to humans um, and all mammals. And so you want to make sure that you're using either the food grade or the insecticide grade. And a lot of the major chemical distributors um, are coming out with their own brands of diatomaceous earth. I know BASF uses Mother Earth and um, other companies are using uh, diatomaceous earth and adding in um, pyrethroid components which is another take it or leave it sort of thing for me but um, you want to make sure that it's that food or insecticide grade diatomaceous earth not the um, whatever I'm saying not the uh, filtration grade sorry <laughs> and I'm I'm advocating the insecticidal grade just because when you buy the insecticidal diatomaceous earth, it will have mm -hmm. a label giving you use instructions for it used as an insecticide. So it's really important that you read the label when you purchase, use, store, and throw away any pesticide product. And the insecticidal grade will be on that. Instructions will be on that label. Um, one more question here, and then I think we've pretty much wrapped it up. I have people who want to rent machines and do it themselves instead of paying $2,000, and I'm assuming it's steam machines. Um, I've heard of that as rental or ha a housing provider having an in-house vacuum or an in-house steam unit that is available to residents for their own use. Those are certainly options, but with any of this and it's a nice this is a nice question to conclude the webinar with is it's all about education on how to use these different um, products and these different devices so make sure this webinar did not qualify you to apply pesticides is it's not an official training for how to do a heat treatment we gave you a lot of hints and hopefully gave you some impetus to go and seek some on-site training from a local pest control professional who has experience with bed bugs. If you are offering steaming units or vacuums to your residents for use or to anyone for use, make sure they understand how to effectively use it and also understand any risks involved. For example, steam can conduct electricity and it is really hot. So um, you want to make sure that your education that goes along with just handing out these different control methods um, is well vetted and is comes from a source that has good experience with using the devices themselves anything to add nope. Molly before I wrap us up I want to thank Molly HUD USDA those who provided pictures and videos and you all 17 of you stuck around to listen to our answers to your questions and thank you so much if you do have any further questions, feel free to email us at stoppests at cornell.edu and stand by because I will be emailing you the link when all this information is posted online.
So thank you again for joining us. Have a great day.